Jesus has a bit of a reputation problem. That seems weird to say that, doesn't it? Because Jesus kind of, in the modern era, has a pretty good reputation on the whole, doesn't he? I mean, church people would say nice things about Jesus, probably. But you would kind of expect them to have to say nice things about Jesus, or else it would be kind of silly to come to church. But even atheists say nice things about Jesus, don't they? I mean, they believe all the Son of God stuff is bonkers if they're atheists. And they don't believe in the resurrection or the miracles. But they still think he was a really nice guy, don't they? And everyone likes Jesus' teaching. As a child, weren't you taught the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Everyone likes that Jesus. He has a really nice reputation. But actual Jesus, real Jesus, that lived and walked and died and rose again, had a real reputation problem. Now, it's helpful to know that in the story today, this is the third time Jesus has been invited to dine at a Pharisee's house. Who are the Pharisees, you might be wondering? Well, they're the right sorts of people. Imagine for a moment that you had a child and you were hoping that she was going to go to an Ivy League college. And who doesn't hope that your daughter goes to an Ivy League college, right? Well, the Pharisees would be the kind of people that probably graduated from an Ivy League college, have lots of money, and donate it back to the college, and could write a good letter of recommendation that just might get your kid in. That's the right kind of person to know, isn't it? They're the kind of person that if you have a business concern going on and you're trying to sell stuff to people, that they could probably introduce you to other rich people. And rich people are good to know if you're trying to sell stuff, because rich people have the money to buy a lot of it. Pharisees were the right sorts of people who could get you into the right sorts of places and the right sorts of parties so that you could do better for yourself financially. How do you suppose each of Jesus' dinners at a Pharisee house ends? He kind of picks a fight with them. Now, have you ever been invited to someone's dinner at their house? Maybe someone you didn't know very well but was an important person, you're just a little bit nervous. Can you imagine finding something to pick a fight about? Just pick, 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 until they're fighting. That does not sound like the kind of person I invite to dinner a second time. How about you? <laughs> but that's just what Jesus does. And all the fights tend to revolve around with whom Jesus spends his time. Now, what's the very most valuable thing that you have? You might think your money, right? Money's pretty valuable, that you buy stuff and do things. But if you run short of money, you've got several different options, really. You could always get another job and make more money at it. You could get a second job and make more money. You could buy fewer things lower your expenses, or you could maybe sell some of your stuff that you're not using anyways and get more money that way. But what if you're running short on time? What are your options? You can't make more time. You can't get a better job and have more time. You can't really do things but so efficiently. The only option you've got is to stop doing some stuff, right? to free up some time. Because time is just a very limited, finite thing. In fact, you are going to work about 9,600 days in your lifetime. Haven't you seen those pictures on Facebook of a parent taking up their kid and the kid's all smiling? First day of school. And then you've got the dad with his lunch bag and his head down. 5,280th day of work. <laughs> it just keeps going, doesn't it? About 9,600 days of working you will get to do. Jesus' ministry was about 960 days. Assuming he never got a cold and took the day off. 
and that he worked every single Sabbath and never honored it and kept it holy. There's probably fewer than 960 days, really. A really short amount of time to do everything that needed to be done. And so, with this already limited resource of time, how did Jesus choose to spend it? Well, he spent it with prostitutes and drunkards and thieves and tax collectors who were secretly just thieves who had a license from the Roman Empire to steal. <laughs> now you laugh, but it's true. Because they would tax you and then they'd tax you extra and keep the extra for themselves and just pay the emperor off. But he spent his time with prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves. Now, when you go to the Pharisee's house and they know that you spend your time with prostitutes and drunkards and thieves, they get a bit nervous. Do you know why? Because they're the right sorts of people, and the right sorts of people don't hang around the wrong sorts of people. And prostitutes and drunkards and thieves are decidedly the wrong sorts of people. If you don't believe me, when you go to work tomorrow, tell your boss that you spent the weekend with a bunch of prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves. <laughs> See how he reacts. I bet they don't put you in charge of the money. <laughs> Right? I mean, you don't tell your boss I spent it with prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves, do you? Because those are the wrong sorts of people, and it will ruin your reputation if you are around them. And yet, over and over again, Jesus gets into fights with people because he keeps spending his time with prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves. Why would he do this? Didn't he know better? Didn't he know they were the wrong kind of people? Of course he knew they were the wrong kind of people. Everyone knows they're the wrong kind of people. And yet, they are the people that Jesus chose to spend his time with. Because they were the people out in the world who needed to receive the good news of the gospel. Who needed salvation brought to their homes. And so Jesus ruined his reputation. Now imagine that Jesus was put in as your priest, or worse yet, your bishop. Some of you laugh, it would be such a terrible idea to have Jesus as a bishop, wouldn't it? I mean, he'd be the worst bishop ever. He'd be lousy at fundraising, because prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves don't have a lot of money to give you for your fundraiser. And his reputation would be so bad that the kind of people who did have a lot of money to give you wouldn't want to receive it. But imagine if your priest or your bishop spent his time out in the world with the wrong sorts of people all the time. Now imagine how that would go when he went to a vestry meeting. He would get to have a chat with the senior warden and probably the bishop about where he's spending his time. And imagine if the bishop were to do it, he would probably get to have a chat with the bishop disciplinary committee and the presiding bishop about where he was spending his time. Because those aren't the right sorts of people. What about you? Where do you spend your time? And with who? I bet many of us live in the right sorts of neighborhoods with the right sorts of people, don't we? And our kids, God willing, go to the right sorts of schools with the right sorts of people. How often do you see someone who does not yet know Jesus Christ? And not just like I'm at Publix and there are people there and they probably don't go to church. That doesn't really count. Everyone has to go to Publix. It's terrible, but you have to go. <laughs> but how often do you really see them? Do you know them? Do you engage with them? Talk to them? How often are you with the type of people who would ruin your reputation if the PTA or your boss or God forbid the church people knew about it? 
What about our church budget and our church's time? What percentage of our budget do we dedicate to sharing the good news with the wrong sorts of people? With those prostitutes and drunkards and thieves? How much of our time and effort is spent doing it? Friends, my prayer for you is that you have a lousy reputation like our Lord. 